it is uh, always an honor to be here, and I, I do want to thank uh, both Secretary Glickman and Secretary Veneman for uh, continuing the fight. Uh, they have been very, very good friends and very good uh, counselors to me in my current position and have been very, uh, in a bipartisan way, focused on a lot of uh, key issues that we still deal with at the, sec at the department and uh, certainly appreciate their friendship uh, and, and certainly their leadership uh, in this organization as well. Um, putting the focus on a number of key issues relating to global food security and had a chance to look at the report uh, and again another excellent uh, uh, report. I see Catherine Bertini is here and uh, I would say that probably my first engagement with global food security was to see her honored as a World Food Prize recipient um, in, in my home state of Iowa and that really began my education. Uh, and she has also been critically important in making sure that this is an issue that uh, the Department of Agriculture continues to take seriously. So I thought about this, uh, this speech and I realized I'm the last person between you and the exit. Um, but I, this is really an important topic and I, I want to take a few minutes of your time if I might. And I was trying to figure out a way to sort of begin to discuss this issue of climate change and its impact on agriculture uh, and it, uh, it, it, it prompted me to think about my four-year-old grandson. Uh, he was here a couple weeks ago uh, in Washington, D.C., and uh, as most four-year-olders are, he was a very curious little fella, and he's very interested in dinosaurs. Uh, so uh, he was given the opportunity to kind of take a look at the dinosaur exhibit uh, that recently uh, closed down to be renovated, but was sort of fascinated with these large animals. And just uh, this week, we, we had the discovery in Argentina of this massive dinosaur bone, and I sent that to his dad, suggested maybe he might want to do some more research on, on dinosaurs. And it occurred to me that there are a lot of us in this world today that sort of take what we have for granted. But when you realize that years and years and years ago, these very, very large animals roamed the earth and that when the climate changed, they're no longer here. And what we're talking about is the discovery of what remains of them. Uh, and I think it is important for us to recognize that we must be serious about climate change in the context of global food security and the capacity of the world to continue to produce enough food in a sustainable way uh, that will allow us as a humankind to continue uh, this great experiment that we're on, and this great journey as a humankind that we're on. Uh, and no department of the federal government has any more responsibility in this area than the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, and we have engaged on a, a fairly aggressive effort in the last several years to really look at this issue uh, as it relates to American agriculture and as it relates to global agriculture. And I thought it would be helpful to all of you to know precisely what we have been doing and why we're doing it, so that you can get a sense of how serious we take this issue. Uh, you all know that, that, that the climate is changing, and you all know and appreciate that it impacts and affects agriculture. More intense weather patterns, longer droughts, more se uh, severe uh, storms, more pests, more diseases, uh, really does have an impact on productivity. And if we don't get serious about adapting and mitigating, that will just continue. And it will compromise our capacity to meet this ever-increasing need. So within the U.S., we decided first and foremost, we have to make sure our house here in the United States is in order. So we have established recently the uh, seven climate change hubs, really designed to take a look at each region of our country in the United States and the agriculture and forestry needs of each region of our country and determine how and where the climate is impacting productivity and how our producers and growers might be given the tools and the technologies to enable them to adapt and mitigate to the changing climate so that we can continue to be a food secure nation and continue to provide expertise, knowledge, technology to the rest of the world so that we may be globally food secure. So we've done the establishment of these research hubs, they're in the process of doing vulnerability assessments. There's seven of them, there are also three sub-hubs 
that are looking at very specific aspects uh, in, in this country, and, and obviously that information is going to be very, very important. We wanted to equip our producers individually with the capacity to begin thinking about greenhouse gases and climate change and, and agriculture's role in all of this. And the U.S. agriculture has done a pretty good job relative to the rest of the world in terms of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, but there's still work to be done. And so we established uh, what is called the Comet Farm Tool uh, from NRCS, and it allows farmers to gauge and use this tool to, to adjust and determine precisely how much greenhouse gas impact certain farming practices will have as they consider them and what conservation practices can be put in place uh, to negate the impact of those greenhouse gas emissions. So equipping them with specific technology and models that they can use on their own individual property. We also uh, have a, a program called GraceNet, which is designed to identify practices that will in, embrace the notion of carbon sequestration through agriculture uh, on the belief that over time we will be creating ecosystem markets where carbon sequestration will potentially be something that a farmer here in this country could market to a regulated industry uh, that, is, that is focused on, uh, on reducing and sequestering carbon. We've also decided to take a look at exactly the impact that this is having on soil across the United States. There are over 6,000 sites where we're now taking samples uh, to make sure that we know precisely the composition of our soil. It's the most massive data collection of soil quality and quantity and, and, and condition in the history of our country. We're engaging uh, certain aspects of agriculture in terms of their impact on greenhouse gases, specifically the dairy industry. Uh, we are working with them as they try to, throughout their supply chain, reduce greenhouse gases by 20 percent by the year 2020. And we are investing and in using our financial resources to encourage more anaerobic digester. So we're really trying to get our house in order, really trying to equip our producers with a, a tools to allow them to evaluate uh, their role in all of this and give us the opportunity to encourage uh, sustainability with data, information, technology, uh, and alike. We also want to share what we know, which is why we've launched the Open Data Initiative, 67 uh, action plans to essentially provide and open up the vaults of the research that has been conducted uh, throughout the United States, publicly financed research that we have sort of retained at USDA for a long period of time. We're now opening that up. We're letting the world see it. We're letting the world use it. And we want that to be encouraged. And we are then using that as a launching pad to establish a global data initiative for agriculture and nutrition. It now has 85 member uh, countries and organizations that they too are collaborating with us and opening up data so that these bright, creative young people who can manipulate and use data will, will be encouraged to take a look at this to determine how best to use this data to give us instructions on how to deal with a changing climate and how to deal with uh, sustainable agriculture. We're even establishing through data.gov applications for individual farmers that they will be able to use on their, on their farms. So this is designed to share the information that we obtain uh, to make sure that we are uh, focused on getting, uh, getting the right results and getting the right information. We also recognize the responsibility that we have as a, a nation to align ourselves with other nations that are also currently working on various aspects of climate change and its impact on agriculture, which is why several years ago we established the Global Research Alliance, now has 41 countries working collaboratively together on livestock operations, crop operations, and rice operations uh, to take a look at how we can better utilize the tools we have, the technology, the information we have, and to ensure that we are not duplicating or replicating research that is being conducted in one of the 41 countries. There is limited amount of resources and financial resources dedicated to agricultural research and we need to use every dollar as efficiently and as effectively as possible. All of that's great, but at the end of the day, we have to do more, which is why we have engaged aggressively in a conversation with the World Bank and other nations. Uh, to establish what we like to refer to and they like to refer to as an alliance for uh, climate smart agriculture. It is really an opportunity for us to take this issue of sustainability 
and figure out it precisely how it ought to work, not just in the United States, not just in individual company, countries, but globally. And by the term sustainability, I don't just necessarily mean focused on environmental sustainability, although that's part of it. We really have to look at the three prongs of sustainability. There is an economic prong, there is a social prong, and there is an environmental prong. Uh, on the environmental prong, it is really all about how you do what you do and the impact it has on the environment, what we can do to mitigate, reduce, re and, and potentially eliminate greenhouse uh, gases directed from agriculture. On the societal side, it's about this whole issue of uh, everything ranging from animal welfare to consumer's right to know uh, how products are being produced, and economically, making sure that whatever we come up with is something that is economically sustainable because at the end of the day, if the bottom line doesn't add up, you're not going to have uh, folks embrace the notion of sustainability. We want them to embrace this. So we're focused on three goals in this alliance. One is obviously to increase productivity in a sustainable way. Two is to make sure that agriculture continues to be resilient uh, to the climate change. And three, how we can indeed, through technology, better technology, better techniques, better knowledge across the globe, reduce and in some cases eliminate the greenhouse gases associated with agriculture and forestry. We want this to be evidence-based, we want it to be integrated, and we want it to be results-oriented. And so our hope is that this gets launched in September uh, as world leaders meet uh, to begin uh, the United Nations conversations. We hope that we are able to launch this effort. And it's not just governments, it's farming organizations, it's scientists, it's folks who are keenly interested in all of this. And at the end of it, we'd like to see better forecasting, better crop management, and better livestock outcomes. It's really pretty simple. Uh, and we are engaged in this as we should be. So I hope that you can see from this that we're taking this issue seriously. I, there are two, or at least one other issue that I want to raise, which we, in agriculture, we have a tendency in this discussion to focus on productivity and the farmer. And that's all well and good, and we should. But I think we must also focus on the consumer, which is why we have initiated a food waste initiative at USDA. When I say 30% of the food that is produced in this country is not used for the purposes for which it is intended, it is indeed wasted. Much of it land, en, ends up in our landfills. It is the single largest solid waste component of our landfills. It is a large producer of methane in our landfills. It seems to me that you can't focus on climate change, you can't focus on agriculture and agricultural policy unless you also focus on the issue of food waste. And so we are aligning ourselves with uh, several hundred companies and organizations within the U.S. to begin a conversation with America about this issue of food waste. Can we look at portion sizes? You know, uh, I go to restaurants, uh, as you probably could expect, quite a lot. Uh, not because of the way I look, but just my job. Um, and from time to time, uh, my lovely wife accompanies me. Uh, and I, I made the mistake the other day of uh, being quoted in the New York Times as saying that my wife was relatively small. So I want to correct that publicly. She's small. I said I was relatively large. <laughs> okay, I'm large. The point of this is when we go out to eat, she receives the same portion I do. <laughs> There's no way in God's green earth she can eat all the stuff that she's given. And yeah, you can take it home, but you know how that works. So we, we really need to be conscious of this because all that ends up in the garbage can. It doesn't have to be. So portion size is important. It's important for consumers to be educated about what it actually means when it says on the container, best buy or sell by or best used by. It doesn't mean the second after midnight on the date you gotta toss it, which is what my son believes. <laughs> Can't tell you how many eggs he's gotten rid of. We need better education. 
about what those labels actually mean, because there's a great deal of food that gets tossed. We need mechanisms so that when a supplier goes to a restaurant, and for whatever reason, whatever he or she's offering that day isn't quite up to the quality standard of that particular restaurant, it doesn't mean that that's no longer usable. There ought to be an application, and I think believe there are, and we're developing these that will allow that distributor to know where within a two block, five block, 10 block, five mile radius, there might be a food bank or a community kitchen that could use that food. We need to be thinking about those things. We need to be thinking about how we are able to, to reuse food uh, in, in that context. And we also need to be th obviously thinking about how we can recycle it. So at USDA today, if you walk down into the back uh, areas of USDA, you'll see garbage cans labeled coffee grounds. We drink a lot of coffee at USDA. And those coffee grounds are being recycled uh, in part in several of our gardens that we are, uh, we, we are operating at USDA. It's a way of recycling food waste instead of having it go into a landfill. So I think the key here is to focus not just on agricultural's role, as significant and as important as it is, but also on the consumer role. And I think USDA has a unique opportunity and a unique responsibility to do that. And we are, we are blessed by the work of the Chicago Council in terms of the direction uh, that we need to be focused on. Uh, you all keep us honest in this process. You point out where we need to do more. And I know that you've had a discussion of risk management. I know you've had a discussion of trade, so I'm not going to get into those issues. Uh, all of those have been raised in the report, and I think adequately so. I, I wanted to focus today's work on what we're doing relative to climate, because this is a serious issue. And this is a period of time where we can no longer ignore this issue, can no longer assume that it will always be the same, because it is constantly changing. Uh, let me just simply say that Our producers in this country are amazing. They are not as fully appreciated as they need to be in terms of their productivity. And they are ready, willing, and able uh, to embrace this change. Some producers in this country are stressed financially uh, because as we become more productive, there's a premium on, on, on production, premium on efficiency, a premium on quantity and quality which makes it sometimes difficult for folks who have middle to small sized operations, which is why we're creating new opportunities and new markets. Extraordinarily resilient out there in farm country, but we also need to make sure that we balance that capacity of resiliency with the ability to be transformative. And I think our challenge is to make sure that we equip people to take the fear out of transformation to educate them that in the long run, this is going to be in their long-term best interests, financially, socially, and environmentally. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here today uh, and uh, appreciate the work that the council's done. Thank you all.